You're listening to Making Money Online with Lisa Johnson, the podcast that tells you what it really takes to build a business and the simple steps to get you there. I'm determined to share with you the reality of easy, simple business marketing tips to make passive income so that you can start making money online. Hi, guys, and welcome to today's episode of the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking to my guest, who is Sarah Jane Lewis. Sarah is a life coach who helps women overcome adversity so that they can live the life that they're meant to be leading. And with this podcast, this podcast, as you know, is called Making Money Online. And everything that we talk about gears towards that. And it's really interesting because quite a lot of people have said, you're interviewing people that have nothing to do with making money online. And it, it's so funny because it couldn't be further from the truth because once you heal who, you know, like the things that are going on in your life and once you start having even an idea of what you want your life to look like and working towards that, that's when you start making money online. So it's actually all really, really important. It's important that we do delve into subjects that are about adversity and that are about the life that you could have. Because when people can't see what they could be doing, they don't even think they can make money online. And it changes everything. Um, I know because I've been through it. So I'm really excited to speak to Sarah Jane Lewis today because I think there are so many people out there who aren't living the life they were meant to. And I was one of those people that were was living a life that I thought, you know, I've just fallen into this life. This is this is how it is. This is how it has to be. And then decided one day, no, I'm going to completely rewrite my story. And, and Sarah has done exactly the same thing. So welcome to the podcast, Sarah Jane. Hi, thank you for having me. No problem. It's good to have you here. I want to go back a little bit with you to the life that you were living before. And at first, you know, you were in a relationship, you were married, and you didn't actually think that you were living the wrong life at that point. What brought to your, what kind of happened to make you think this isn't the life I should be living? This isn't how it's supposed to be? I think it was always there. I always had these moments of what the hell is going on? Like going to bed crying, waking up dreading for the day ahead or dreading the weekends to happen because you can't bear the thought of spending like family time together because it's just awful. It's just not fun or you, you spend the end of the weekend feeling more drained than when you started. And I think I went through periods of just numbing everything and pretending everything was OK and then something would pop up again. You go, oh, it's happened again. Okay, what do I need to do this time to fix it? And I think the the pivotal moment was after having baby number two, I'd lost a baby. There was telltale signs that things weren't right. We weren't communicating. There was no kind of real love or trust in the relationship. And I decided to put myself first. I was very overweight. I was told I was overweight and that I should do something about it. So I did. Uh, By By your husband. Nice. I was fat mama Lula. That oh, was oh, nice. Yes. And amongst other words, which was all a joke, you know, as, as they do. But, you know, words cut deep after a while when they're repeated as well. And I think the pivotal point was I remember very clearly August, two o'clock in the morning, finished off my second bottle of red wine, binge watching Mad Men on Netflix, because that moment in the middle of the night when nobody else is awake, you're by yourself, it was just my time. And I thought, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep having the hangovers. I can't keep numbing this pain that is very clearly there that I'm trying to avoid constantly. So I went on this, just started very easily, just eating better, moving my body and just making time each day for myself. And very quickly, within a a few weeks, I felt so much better. My head felt clear. I was losing weight. And people were making comments, especially him. It was like, why are you doing that for? Like, why do you need to go out again? Why? Why? Well, it made me more determined, if anything, to prove him wrong, because he was very much expecting me to kind of fall on my ass and just give up. And I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And within a period of three to four months, I lost three stone. I joined a triathlon club. I was going out of the house for training sessions. I was meeting people. I and you we weren't really... doing that before, were you? Because you no. were kind of quite controlled by your partner. So you were you were just in your house all of the time doing the kids stuff. 
Yep, so full-time job, working from home, doing the school runs, making sure dinner's on the table, making sure the house is clean and tidy, making sure the bills were paid. I was very much kind of there all the time. So when I started to go out, started to just swim in the evenings, that's all I was doing. There was nothing untoward to it. I was meeting other kind of crazy people that really inspired me that, that had these crazy dreams, tra- crazy goals to run Ironmans and swim in the sea and to ride up hills. I was like, that sounds amazing. And it would get me out of the house. So I signed up to do that. I was so like, right, if they can do it, then I certainly can. Yeah. And I went on this whole self-discovery journey of training to do a half Ironman, which absolutely just my other half at the time just didn't like it. It was like, why do you have to do that? What are you doing tonight? Why? And I, I'd never leave him in a situation where you'd have to do anything when he was home. The washing was done. The kids were in bed. Look, just babysit your own children, please. Well, <laughs> I just go, <laughs> well, I go out for half an hour, please. And it, it led to kind of a series of really unfortunate events, which were pretty scary at the time. But I remember very clearly that Christmas, sat around the Christmas dinner table, knowing this was my last Christmas. This was my last Christmas in this house because a few weeks before, if not a week before, I'd gone to a PT session and walked across a train line and just thought, you know what, if I just stood here, would that matter? Would it matter really? Because I'm putting all this effort, I'm trying my best to be a better wife, trying to look better, trying to be appealing and still don't feel loved, don't feel valued, don't feel appreciated. So do I really matter? And that for me, I thought, do you know what? What on earth are you up to? I mean, yeah. If you're having and, those thoughts. Yeah. And when you look back now, it's really hard when you're in it because you think it's normal. I've been in a domestic abuse relationship and you feel it's normal. And that actually the reason that they're worried about you going out and the reason they're being controlling is because they care about you. And, you know, this is his way of caring about you. And actually, it's so dangerous because it keeps you away from anybody else and from seeing what's normal out there and how other people behave and how they don't behave. And and I think actually that's what men like that, like narcissistic abusers, want. They want you to not realise that actually this is an abnormal situation. But it's really interesting to me how it changes over time, because when you got married, obviously that wasn't the case. And Although when you look back. (laughs) When I look back, huge, huge red flags. I mean, um, wedding night, uh, the weeks after our wedding, our honeymoon. Like I look back now and I'm like, oh my God, you should have run. Like, why didn't, why everything changed literally when we got married. That's quite common. Yeah, I was very much kept from my parents. There was a little bit of a family falling out as kind of big wedding events. You bring everybody together, everybody has an opinion. And I, I didn't speak to my mum and dad for about six months after getting married because he didn't approve of it. And there was, yeah, there was lots that happened around there. But you carry on. You're like, well, I've got married now. Like, I can't, I've spent 20 grand. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell everybody we're not doing this anymore. What would they say? And then um, kids come along and that changes things again because then you're there for children and, and you know, you can't break up a family and all of those kind of things and so you stay there because of that kind of situation but it does often get to a point where you realize that things aren't right and and tell me a little bit about because you started you know going out and you started doing these things and you could tell that he wasn't happy about that in particular but you were getting a bit of a newfound confidence because of what was happening to you But then you found something really worrying didn't you and then this would have also been the point where I would have gone no, this is not right. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, a mini event that happened prior to that was I'd gone through, like you said, my confidence had improved and uh, all this time I'd been working full time and he worked part-time. He transitioned into a full-time job and then got a huge £10,000 pay rise. So for the first time in our whole relationship, he earned more money than me. And I was like, wow, that's great that's amazing like we can do this we can go on holidays we can pay for this and it was like yeah 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 we can and again red flag feeling a little bit clearer in my head and it it triggered me and I was like right okay and um, that night after getting this big pay rise he went food shopping and he brought himself food for himself filled up the fridge with food for himself including a 15 pound piece of fresh tuna and it's a bit odd but bear with me but he brought this piece of fresh tuna and I said to him I was like our dinner for tonight he went 
no, that's mine. And I was like, right, okay. So you get this big pay rise. All of a sudden, you're just looking after yourself, whereas I look, looked after everybody. He's like, oh, well, I can't do anything. Right, rah, 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 blah, blah, blah. I don't know what you eat anymore. And he just went off on one. And I went, that is it. I cannot do this anymore. We are over. We're not married anymore. Leave. And he's like, no, I'm not leaving. Rah. This went on over a period of months. In my head, that was it. Marriage over, everything done by. What proceeded was, because he didn't understand that I had this newfound strength, I had this newfound confidence, that I was actually standing up for myself. I wasn't tolerating his crap anymore. He started to stalk me. He cloned my phone. He could see all my emails, my Facebook. He put a tracker on the car. That's terrifying. He put cameras in the house. He knew what I was doing, when I was doing it. And... I could see, I knew something wasn't right because he was dropping comments into conversations. I'd be talking to my friend and he would say, you speak to her all the time, don't you? And I'd be like, well, yeah, like she's my mate. Oh, okay. So, you, and he would drop in something else. And I'd think, how do you know that? Unless he's picked up my phone or read something. And this went on for a little while. And it got to a period where I went to work one day, left the house, purposely left my phone in the office and went for a walk, went to the shops or something like that and brought the kids some iPads. Because if you could imagine, we had two kids. I think Annabelle was four or five at the time. My, my youngest was barely two and the atmosphere in the house was yeah, terrible. And he was using her to talk to me, which I found really disturbing. Oh, look at mummy. Doesn't she look nice today? And she'd be like sat there going all right okay and it was just a weird vibe so I went and got them these little tablets and some headphones just so to protect them in this weird environment that we're in at the moment between tuna fish gate and kind of <laughs> trying to trying to end my marriage but living in this twilight zone he picked me up from the train station after I got the train back from Guildford and I said oh, I brought these tablets today he said I didn't know you did that and I was like why would why you, would you? <laughs> why would you like that was really odd and I went home and I sat on the sofa and I kid you I sat frozen for about six hours apart from popping to the local one stop to top up on wine and booze because I'd been sober for about five or six months at this point and just that comment just triggered me and sent me back into this spiral of holy moly I won't swear what is going on here? I just need to just numb myself. And I sat there for six hours, just frozen, just drinking, just numbing out everything. The kids were plugged in. Somehow, I think he put them to bed. I just, and he was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm like, I can't, like huge like thoughts going through my head. I feel like I'm being watched no matter what I do. And I thought if I just sit still and freeze, nothing can happen. Had you worked out at this point that he that he had cameras everywhere, that he'd put cameras kind of on your phone and all of these kind of things and that he could see everything you were doing? Or were you just confused? There were signs. I had an Amazon delivery come to the door and I opened up, as you do, comes to the house to open it up and didn't realise it was to him. And it was a little box. And I was like looking at it and I was like, okay, put it down. And I thought something's not quite right with that. It's a very small camera. Why when you've got phones, would you need a camera? Picked it up again and it dawned on me. I was like, this is a spy camera. And my whole world, just remember the blood just rushing out of me. I phoned my friend. I was like, this is what's happening. She's like, right, don't panic. Hide it. Don't give it to him. He made out when he asked for the, where the delivery was. He was like, well, it's just for work. I was like, why didn't work order it? Why isn't it gone to your workplace? Yeah. Oh, yeah, nothing, nothing. Don't worry. So I ended up giving it over. But at that moment, it was, this is all happening very much in like a couple of weeks, very short time period between little things happening and that realisation of actually he is using this equipment in the house. So, yeah, I, I kind of went around in very hyper vigilant mode, sticking my fingers up to teddy bears and just swearing at light fittings because I, I honestly, I sound like a complete nutcase. No, but, but I, was... I think that they turned you into that. Like it would yeah. turn me into that. Like imagining like what there are cameras everywhere. You know, he's watching me. You can't get away from that. I think there's nothing more scary than that kind of feeling that you don't really know 100%, but that you are being stalked by your own husband. In your own home, where you're meant to feel safe, where your children are meant to feel safe. 
And this went on for a very little time. And it was just that one comment when I left the house, I thought there's more to this. There's, there's something on me daily. I'm holding up my phone because he knew just all my movements, what I was doing, what I was saying. And that just, I, was just, I can't live like this anymore. This is going to kill me. I'm going to do something to myself. I feel unsafe because prior to that, he, in the way that these things happen, they tell you that they can't live without you. They won't live. They're going to do something to, to themselves. And he did. He tried to commit suicide while we we're on holiday, tried to drown himself in the sea. And when he came out after being rescued, this the kids were on the beach. I was on the beach and this was all going on. He came up and went, oh, well, that didn't work, did it? What happens when, I think you're a mum, you almost go into survival mode. You're like, right, don't rock the boat. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Keep the kids safe. Keep the kids near you. Just try and tread carefully because what I very much believed is nobody would believe me because there was no, nothing I could show anybody. There was nothing. Yes, I'd spoken to my friend about this camera and I could say no that proof. rescue, but there's no proof of the kind of psychological things because in all intents and purposes, he came across as happy, smiley. They often do. Lovely. Yeah. Like, yeah, they often you're do. You're the weirdo, Sarah Jane. Like, you're the one with the problem. I'm like, oh, you don't know what's going on in my world. And it was scary. So that morning after just being frozen for six plus hours and going to bed, I woke up and I thought, I can't, I don't want to live like this. I like that what... wasn't your life. Like no. you were in a life that you didn't want to be part of. And I felt responsible because I felt like I'd created this life. That's the thing, the weird situation that you have going on here. You have this guilt. You're like, well, I've actively participated in the creation of this relationship what have I done wrong? I must have done something wrong. And you end up kind of piling it back on yourself. But I didn't feel safe. And in that moment, after he left the house, I was like, right, literally door shut, ran round. And you know, those little 99p checkered colour carrier bags that you get yeah. from the cheap shop, loaded as much stuff in there as possible, passports, birth certificates, things that, you know, Jason Bourne would do to like leave the country. <laughs> just like this yeah. mad moment. And just put the kids and the dog in the car and just showed up at mum and dad's. Knowing full well, he would know I was there because he was tracking the car. And I said, I just can't go back. And they were like, okay, we kind of been expecting this because we knew something wasn't right. And that was it. Never, ever went back. Never. There was a huge fallout. It was horrendous. I Just the worst experience of my whole life. But the best, because I it, knew that if I faltered and fell for the, oh, it won't happen again routine, I would still be there. And and I think there is this mid zone. There is this, this very small line when you walk out of one life and you start another where some people are dragged back into the life that they had before. And I think it takes a lot of bravery to stand your ground and say, no, I'm, I don't even know what this life looks like that I'm going into. I can't even picture it, but I'm, I know that it's not this. And I'm walking into that one and I've been there and I understand it. Did he ever admit to the stalking? No, no and yes. He told me he had information, he had pictures. He was going to sh show it to all the mums at school. He was going to post it on the internet, going to take it to social services. I mean, I went to court over this and they didn't believe me. Oh. They didn't believe me. I sat in a courtroom and said, all these things happened to me. And they went, where's your proof? The lady that I was talking to, when I said about WhatsApp and all these things, she said, what's WhatsApp? Oh. I'm like, whoa, yeah, it's not gonna work. <laughs> You're not gonna understand my whole world if, if you don't even grasp one application. So it was a real battle. And in the end, I decided my life and my happiness and the children's happiness was worth more than just proving something. I needed yeah. to move on. I, I was out of it, and that was the main thing. And in three months, I can't even believe how quick it was from the day that I actually left and was uh, rocked up at mum and dad's and they looked after me to getting the keys to a brand new house was phenomenal just in this but I was determined I thought I'm not going to be that person that suffers that just kind of never gets on with their life that's constantly reliving the past that's constantly in the mercy of threats and I was like no that ends you can say and do what you want I'm not there and I got the keys to my new house and just started this whole new life which is just evolved so much in the past three years since I got the keys to the house because now it's all up to you now every decision you make is your decision and you can be who you want to be and I think that it's amazing when people 
close a door that they think had to, you know, they would never get out of and then start a new life. I've seen it happen time and time again and see people flourish when they're given the freedom Mm. to actually make something of themselves and do the things that they always wanted to do. And it's, it's amazing that you've done that and that you're in this new life and you're now helping other women who have had adversity in their lives to find a way to making the life that they really want to have, not the life they're living now. And there will definitely be people listening to this podcast that are like, I'm in the position where I'm in a life, not necessarily just because of, you know, a narcissistic husband or domestic abuse, but other kind of situations where they're like, this isn't the life that I wanted to live. How did I end up here? And how can I just start again? It doesn't mm. seem possible for me. So what advice do you give people who come to you who are like, I'm not happy. This isn't where I want to be. I feel like there's a different life out there for me. Firstly, it's just being aware of that. I think awareness is key. I think when you numb that pain, when you try and stuff it down and you try to hide it with stuff and things, it resurfaces and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So be aware of what's going on. And adversity and unhappiness, they come in so many different shapes or forms. We're talking about kind of the extremes. But if you're not content or happy, you're not going to live your best life. That means the people around you, the ripple effects of that, are not going to have their best lives. So for me, it was being aware that I needed to do something so my kids had a better life. They didn't repeat my patterns. Secondly, do something about it, wishing, hoping, visualizing. It's great. It kind of sets your intentions, but take some action, make small steps. For me, it was going to do some qualifications. I did qualifications in fitness and nutrition. I then went on to do other things and just layered on, but it just started with that one one step, step. one step, just knowing that I had bigger ambitions, but I had to start somewhere. And I think that's key, awareness and action. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and I think people often think it needs these massive steps, like these huge, big shifts. And actually, tiny steps over a period of time, you can look back and realise how far you've come. And sometimes you even realise, actually, you're, not, you're no longer living the life you were living. Like when I was in corporate, I remember thinking, God, is this it? This isn't the life that I thought I'd be living. I've always wanted an extraordinary life. This isn't an extraordinary life. I'm doing exactly the same as what everybody else does. I'm I'm chained to a corporation that I can't get away from. I'm living hand to mouth and that isn't what I wanted. And it wasn't like this massive big thing happened where I walked out of one, you know, life and, and marriage and workplace and suddenly was in another. It was tiny steps every single day to get me to the new life. And it was one day I woke up and thought, God, I'm living the life that I've always wanted to live. And And you're a huge inspiration for so many people, even for myself. So yeah, no. And I think it's just like you said, that one step, just make a decision and do it. And what do you think stops people from doing that? Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what people think. Fear of failure. And do you know what? You will fail. And that's fine. And you will learn and you won't do it again. And you might fail at something else and you'll learn. And that's OK. Do you know what? I, the way that I see life and view life now, later on, after everything I've been through, it's almost like a game. It's like you throw a dice. Just do whatever comes your way. Say yes to things. Just I mean, I'm doing it. Be inspired. Honestly, close my eyes. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand on stage and tell my story. Are you scared I, of that? Oh my God, doing this is scary. Telling people what happened to me, what happened. And I think, what about the repercussions? What if something else happens? What if my internet gets tapped? What if I, these fears will always be there, but I'm not letting them stop me. I just, and my life has just blossomed and exploded. And it is because I'm not letting that fear stop me from living my life. Yeah, we all know that fear and success don't go hand in hand. And fear is a good thing in some ways. It's I always think it's a good thing to hold on to because the fear is there for a reason. It keeps us safe, but we have to not let it be the loudest voice in our heads because if it is, we'd never do anything. Like like you, I'm terrified of stages, but I'll, I'll do it because I know it's the right thing um, and will change my life. And I believe everybody has the power to have an extraordinary life, to have the life that they absolutely always dreamed of. And sometimes when you first think about it, you think, no, that's not for me. 
that's for other people. Like I can see how other people can have that. And I used to do that. You know, I used to look at people who were multimillionaires and who were living, you know, this lifestyle of going around the world. And I'd be thinking, yeah, yeah, we can all have that life, can we? You try try telling me that single parent of twins, you know, who grew up in a council estate is completely different for me. I realized I was just telling myself these stories that were keeping me from doing anything. And now I live that life that I always wanted to live. And I I honestly believe anyone can. And it's, I I love talking to people like you, because if I'd have told you when you were in your relationship and you were right smack bang in the middle of it, that in four years time, things will be completely different from you. You'll be so happy when you wake up in the morning. Would you have believed me? Nope. I would have thought that's my lot. That's it. What can I do? I'm powerless. And I am so far from that. I realized I do have the power. Everybody does. Yeah, we all have the power to make our own decisions at the end of the day. And of course, those decisions will always come with repercussions. And so it's about weighing up, you know, what's important for you? What is the thing that's important for you? I think life is so short. And I think we get such a small amount of time on this earth that we have to do everything in our power to make sure that every second of it is doing something that we actually want to do. Because if it's, if it's not, then we're wasting time and we don't have time to waste. I saw um, Steve Jobs once on stage and he was talking about, I think I saw it on YouTube and it might still be there. He was talking about how the thing that drives him is looking around a room and realizing that in just a short amount of time, all of the people in that room will be gone. He will Mm. be gone. And it's so powerful when you think of life as as short as as it is. That fear doesn't have a place there then. You have to go and do things because time will run out one day and you don't want it to be running out before you've done all of the things that you really want to do and living that one extraordinary life that you want. I'm so glad that you are now and that you're helping other people to do the same thing because that's what it's all about. So thank you. If somebody is like feeling like I know that I'm not living my potential, I know that this isn't the life I'm supposed to be in and they want to come and hang out with you and learn from you, where is the best place for them to do that? You can find me at www.sj-lewis, that's L-E-W-I-S dot com. You'll find all my information and lots of amazing freebies and a free group called Transform Your Life. Brilliant. And that's what it's about, transforming your life. And we'll put those links in the show notes as well. So guys, you can go straight there and have a look. But please know from me and from Sarah that you can transform your life. We're both living proof of it. There are many people when you seek them out that are living proof of this. So if you're not living the life you really want to, now's the time. And if that includes making money online, now's the time for that too. I never thought five years ago, I would ever be able to make money online. And now I do. And um, Sarah Jane Lewis does as well. So, you know, there's time for you and there's, it's never too late to start to change the things that you want to change in your life. Thanks for being here. Thanks for telling us your story. I know it's a, one of those stories that's quite vulnerable to tell because I understand the repercussions of you telling it. And, you know, I'm honored that you've done that on this podcast. So thank you for being here and thank you everybody else for listening and tune in for the next story next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to Making Money Online with Lisa Johnson. If you'd like to get hold of my guide to launching, go to lisajohnson.com forward slash launch and let's get you making money online.